we've been here ever since they drug us here in chains, and never once did they treat us fair. We had something and they wanted it. The man that was introduced is my grandfather, Edward Carvey I. He's the longest civil rights protester in North American history. And what he means to me is, is much more than my words could ever describe. He, he's a, a glimmer of hope, inspiration, determination. And it, it takes a champion to be willing to sacrifice all the little things along the way to hopefully bring his people as a whole back home together. I'm happy to know that these podcasters are interested in what happened to Africa. It's something that has to be told. You may have heard about the community of Africville before, but do you know the real story? The Africville relocation was presented as a liberal and humanitarian measure to improve the living conditions of underprivileged people. What went wrong? They cheated us, and I'm one that was cheated. We didn't have to move into the city to have beautiful homes. We had beautiful homes in Africville. If you don't move at a certain time, We'll bring out the bulldozers and push your shacks over. It's time that we looked at them wrongs and righted them. I know we'd all fight to get back out there. We still call it home. Can we get you to end on the note of, let's hear, Africville forever? Africville forever and a day. This is a story of adversity and survival after near total destruction. A fight to reclaim land that was taken and save a community that was destroyed. What was once a proud historic black community in the city limits of Halifax, Nova Scotia is now almost totally eradicated. This was a special place, one of the first black settlements to own land in North America. Now, all that remains are descendants, memories, and token monuments in a park. It's the kind of story you'd never believe had happened in the 20th century in Canada. But as you'll find out, the fight for justice is far from over. My name is Alfred Bergeson. I'm 25 years old. I'm a social entrepreneur and a community advocate based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I moved to Canada from Ghana when I was six years old. I first learned about Africville when I was a teenager. The story of Africville shook me to my core. Since then, it has been a cause close to my heart. And in my search for answers, I have got to know the survivors and their descendants. People who have been displaced and raised in a community undone by relocation. Yeah, no, it it resonates or it can potentially resonate with a lot of people because for me, the way I look at it is just another arm of colonialism, right? Like this has been going on for a long time. So a a lot of different ethnicities and groups of people have have faced similar struggles. This is my co-host, Eddie Carvery III. He is an Africville descendant and the grandson of Eddie Carvery I, Africville's controversial defender and the man behind the longest civil rights protest in North American history. What happened in Africville, you you really have to take it into the context of what it was. Um, After that long 400-year journey, slavery, here's this Mecca, this free land right on the water. Everything that you need is provided to you by God, by the land. And then down the road, provided the opportunity to actually be a part of society and own such a a valuable piece of property was the next step, the next milestone. And along the way, lots of great things have happened. But for them to to take all of that away from you as not only a person, but a community member, it hurts, right? And and I think a lot of people can, can relate to the fact that if they had witnessed even their their homes burning down or any tragedy that really touches that those heartstrings, it, it's easy to relate. If you close your eyes, forget skin color, it's easy to relate to what happened to Africville because if that happened to any white town the way that it did, well, whoever whoever was on, in charge of that decision, buddy, you got to go. 
Over the next few episodes, Eddie and I want to tell you the real story of Africville. We'll be speaking with descendants, survivors, and community advocates. We'll also be including archive audio from news and personal collections so that you can experience the beating heart of a community that refuses to be forgotten. Like many, Eddie Carvery's very public display of protest was my introduction to the people of Africville and their fight. Since 1970, at huge personal sacrifice, his protest camp on the original site of Africville has stood firm in the face of time, intimidation, bureaucracy, and disappointment. I I had heard about Africville, and obviously since living in Halifax, I had, you know, drove past it, but I didn't have a strong connection to the place until I met Eddie Carvery, honestly. Literally one day I saw that he was selling his, his t-shirts and, you know, the power to the people t-shirts. Yeah, and all power to the people. Right, and raising awareness of the issue. And literally it was a random day, I was summer day, I was driving back from Ikea and I was on the bridge and I looked down and I saw his I saw his trailer there. Like, oh, I saw I saw I a bunch stop. of I saw flags going <laughs> and I said, okay, th- I'll, I'm gonna let me let me let me check it out. Let's see what's going on. And yeah, just got out my car and walked up and I said, Hey, what's going on? My name is Alfred. <laughs> you ready, Carvery? Like, pleasure to meet you. Like, <laughs> oh, he loves that an initial honor. interaction too, right? Like, he, an his honor eyes to meet probably you. lit up. And I, and yeah, we just we chatted back and forward for for a little bit. And you know he would he was giving me advice on on how I could keep up the fight of Africville as as a, as a civilian as a as a person as someone who lives in Halifax in Canada as a Canadian citizen now I just asked him like what advice do you have to to me if I want to do anything what, and, do you know do you remember what he said at that time or no I mean his generally he, he was like we got to keep going yeah we got to keep going this is not over just that like that <laughs> determination hey that, just that don't pure, give up and keep pushing it was like this is not over and um and i i was that was something that compelled me and and the other thing that compelled me was um he also he also gave me advice in terms of be happy um okay it's another thing he said and I found it really interesting that he was, while pushing this justice issue, this this injustice that had happened at Africville, he's still reminding me to be happy. And I was like, this is an interesting dude. <laughs> yeah, no, for real. But you know it, I mean? it, it, and, it takes and, that much. If you're struggling and going through the, the trenches and, and you can still put that smile on your face at the end of the day, know you're blessed to be here, to be able to fight. Well, I think that's what he means, like when he talks about that, because that's that's what it is for him, right? Absolutely. Just that. I think that's what we got to do is just smile, be happy, but keep fighting, bro. Absolutely. But Eddie gave me more than just advice. This interaction led to a new friendship that has brought me closer than ever to the Africville fight. I came back a few days later and that's when I was just, you know, I wanted to learn more about Eddie's story. I wanted to learn more about the family because this was a, I feel like this was a side of the Africville story that I didn't really, I didn't really hear before. Yeah. Like I knew of Eddie Carvery um, and, you know, people had made just remarks about who this man was and I didn't really think about it. You know what I mean? Until I met him and I was like, wow, like this is someone that has so much knowledge and history and has so much to offer. And so I was just curious in learning more about about Eddie and the family. And then the day that you came out and we linked up, I was like, okay, there's like, there's a soldier. Like, yeah, 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 no, <laughs> there, there, for there's, sure. there's, there's another soldier that I can work with here. One day um, I headed down to Africville see my grandfather in the trailer that he uh, he had gotten from the generosity of the folks that donated to his GoFundMe. And um, when I arrived, there was this tall, slender black man that I've never seen a day before in my life. And when he had turned around, I had seen this little grammar school 
jacket on him. And I, I thought to myself, oh, this could be interesting, right? And I heard him talking and, and, and still asking the same types of questions, direct but polite and respectful as he does today. I, I thought right then and there, like, okay, this is this is somebody that maybe I can connect with that I can explore the type of work that granddad was doing. Maybe maybe this is a, somebody that can motivate me to be a better me to provide a better way forward for my community. And he's done nothing but that. After that, it just it developed into to a, to a real friendship, something genuine. At the jump of meeting each other, we connected on a similar experience. We both knew we wanted to do something with Africville. You had you know things you wanted to put out there. I had a tool that could get it out there, and we just linked up and we're like, yeah, let's do this. So now you know us and what we're fighting for, but I bet you're wondering, what about the legendary Eddie Carvery I? A man who has become the symbol for Africville's fight back. Eddie is a humble man in his 70s with a sweet tooth. Better finish all your candies before we start. <laughs> Hear the chewing uh, in the in the, the wrappers and shit. Uh. <laughs> I'm all excited. You're excited? <laughs> yeah, right. Good. Good. Mm, yeah. <laughs> He's nervous, is what he means. No. Why are you nervous? I'm not nervous. I'm not nervous. I've been in this business a long time. <laughs> you have. Yeah. I sure have. So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on having an opportunity to get the story I, out I, to the world again. I really think it's about time. Um, I've been in there doing this protest since like around 1970. I was 20 years old, now I'm 75. So that gives you some idea of how much time that I've put into this protest. It's been my life. Um, I think what happened in Africville is an atrocity and how they, how this society can allow the city of Halifax to do what they did to our community of Africville and get away with it. I mean, they did everything wrong. What was well, your goal when you started your protest? Well, um, when, I, when I first started this protest, um, I had been... I had went away when I was 17. I made it to Toronto, and that's when they were first to get rid of Africa. And when I came back home, sure enough, the Africa, they were doing it. The bulldozers was in the Africa, and they were tearing it down. And it was sad. It, 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 it just broke my heart. My grandmother, she was one of the last people to leave. She had the post office. She used to read the mail to the people that couldn't couldn't read or write. And, uh, she was all that. She was also a mid-mother, and she was an elder, and it was people like Mrs. Tolliver and other elder people that were left behind. And they were the founders. They were there for Africville, and they stayed the time. And uh, So you were among the last to leave. Yes, but uh, yeah, exactly. And you but, never uh, left. You, you. <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, I went. Uh, I, I got all upset about everything, especially what was happening with my grandmother. My mother's father had passed in Liverpool, Finn Thompson. So she was in Africa taking care of her family in Africa. She had to leave Africa to go to Liverpool to take care of grandfather, her father. Time she got back to Africa, Africa was gone. Tell us about the early days of your protests. Well, you know, like when when I first started to protest, like I was young, and at that time there was uh, such groups like the Black Panthers and uh, militant groups like that. And I was attracted to uh, uh, the Black Panther movement because what had, what they were doing, and they were fighting for black people, and they were brave, and they were courageous, and I. So had you, were, a chance. you were inspired by that. I was, I was, I was humbled, and I was inspired, and I knew what I was going to do, but I had my, I had my P's and Q's all messed up, because the first thing I was going to do, I was going to get some dynamite, and I was going to blow the bridge up. Now I was very young, and I was very serious. And uh, along with that, I had decided that I would get into council in the city hall 
and I will plant some bombs in there and blow that place up and it was no regard about the human life. And I was there, I was that angry, and I was that upset, and I went to my mom, and I told her my plan. I said, I'm going to get him, I'm going to blow that bridge up, and I'm going to blow City Hall. Well, my mother straightened me out on that one very fast. I mean, you know, like, I, I, I love my mother. She's always been my best friend and what was, my best what was advisor. Her, what, what was her, her advice? Her advice to me was not to do it. She asked me, she said, are you crazy? You can't do that. She said, what good are you going to do if you, even if you do blow up the bridge? It's not going to stop nothing. They're going to put you in jail for the rest of your life. If you go down there and you harm people, then, you know, like, uh, and so... Uh, and then she, she, she said, if you really want to do something, you'll go out to Africville and you'll lay on the ground and you'll start to protest and you'll stay there until they hear you, until uh, uh, someone's doing something about what they did to us. And that, that hit me right in my heart. And it, it was just like God, God himself had told me to because I just left the house. I went to Africville, and I started on the ground. And I laid on the ground up there, and my brother Victor, he's gone now. But he had come out and, uh, I, it was a few years later, but he did join me. And I, I just stayed, and I fought, and I stayed because that was the right thing to do. I, I knew that. What drove I mean, you? You you were there for decades. The, the 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 plain truth is that time now that it's gone by it seemed like a flash in the pan. At times there was a Ku Klux Klan, full gear and their white uniforms. They'd marched on me and uh, scare me to death and uh, uh, chase me. But uh, I was from Africa and I knew hiding places that they didn't know about, and so I got good at waiting for them, and when they come out to harass me, well, there was no lights, and so I was very invisible, and they learned very quickly that they wasn't going to stop me, and they were endangering their own lives by harassing me. Uh, I mean, I was harassed by people, by white people. Like I said, my, 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 my spirituality carried today, and I gave it up for God. I was the first guy for the job. But nobody else wanted it, so it was left up to me. And I did it, and through the grace of God, that's the only thing I know, because I'm telling you something, man. When you're laying on the ground in the winters in Africa, and the sun is in the winters, and it turns from months to years, then to decades, and then to, like, uh, and I'm still out there, by the way. I'm still in Africa. I've got a trail out there today. And uh, the protest is still real. And it is still going on. Eddie has spent his entire adult life in protest. The impact on his life is such that it has defined him. Eddie III feels sadness at the unfair labeling of his grandfather, who for decades had to take on every insult and yet kept on fighting. When like he's far from perfect, and like I, I don't want to try to portray him. Nobody's as, perfect, right? I don't want to try to portray him as innocent because Crazy Eddie is Crazy Eddie. That is true. There's no denying that. But the person inside that never got to flourish or be fully developed to his potential of who or what he could have become was pushed aside early, early in his life, and, and he had to just deal with life as it came to him on the minute by the second. So. I think that now when people actually get to know the man behind the stories and all of that, they see he's not much different than you or I, and he really does have a lot to contribute both from his mistakes and the lessons that he learned and also through the things that he has accomplished by being that guy in people's face, by being almost that character that the media portrays him as like i think it it, it, like i said it's hindered his reputation but it's also to some degree it's kept the story put him put him out there right bad publicity is still good publicity to some degree he's kept the conversation going regardless of whether people were speaking about him in a negative tone or a positive tone right yeah no for sure but i i think the thing that gets to him the most is 
like recently, like I said, with the GoFundMe, he's received like support that he feels that what he's done actually did mean something. But prior to that, not only within this province or country, within his own community, he, ne he never really received much love or support. He has to not do it alone because he knows he's not alone, but just not feel cherished. Supported, wanted, supported, supported, empowered. Yeah, right, yeah. Because I think that's what plays on him the most. Now that he's getting to that older age, he's looking back and thinking like, geez, if I just would have had support on my front and – I, it just plays on his mind, I think, when it comes to things like that. Does it play on yours? Um, yeah, it definitely does. Like, I can't, I can't lie at the fact. Like, there's been numerous occasions where there's things that have happened that I don't think that he gets enough recognition for what he's done because uh, I don't care if you're digging dirt 50 years every day. If you can be that committed to do something like that, you, you're you're a special type of person, right? So. For Eddie Carvery, seeing the next generation take up the fight makes every second of the protest worth it. So I, I just like to, to, to pat my own grandson on the back. That's what gives me my power. My children and the people that I associate with, they feel positive about what I'm doing. And as long as I know I'm on the right track, time will tell. But if we want to eliminate racism, let's go to Africa and start there. Give the Africa people what's rightfully theirs, and so we all can join the same club. Outside of that, there, there, there is no middle road. There is no answer. There's just two sides, the right side and the wrong side. Either you're a racist or you're a real human being. Well, I choose to go as the human beings, and I think we can eliminate racism if we go to Africville and put it back. We could do so much more. Like I said, there's a housing crisis in Canada. We've got land out in Africville that can accommodate tens of thousands of people. Why aren't we taking advantage of it? Eddie believes that giving the land back to the community of Africville is the only way to right the wrongs. So what remains of the physical community? Well, after 50 years, a small park stands on the shores of Halifax's northern peninsula. When you're arriving to Africville, you Across the train tracks, you come down the main streets, under the bridge, and you'll see a boat launch, you'll see a park, and then you'll see this yellow church with a red roof, and this is a replica of the original uh, Africville uh, church that was here. It's now the Africville Museum. You'll see um, Eddie Carvery's trailer, um, there are massive ships that come through this area. Uh, lots of cargo on trains. Despite being forcibly removed from the land, it holds a special place for the younger generations. What was your first memory of being here in Africa? My first memory? Um, I can highlight some, maybe that might be a little easier because there's so many that I don't like recall exactly what the first memory is. But my grandfather, before they made the bylaw, um, back when the G7 protests, I mean, G7 summit happened here in Halifax, he was occupying in the park. And then that's when they made it a, a bylaw that staying overnight in the park was illegal. So him and my uncle racked up quite a bit in fines and they were harassing him. So he decided to leave the park and at the time this whole area was like undeveloped it, it almost looked wild you would say there was lots of bamboo tall grass and what he did was he hunkered down and he cut out himself a little living quarters and that's where it all started in my memories like of from when I can remember so there would be like we'd come down cut rhubarb up chew on it have just play like kids explore over in the, the woods there was wild blueberries still over there but one of my most 
valuable memories from down here was my parents. They actually got married down here, and it, it was quite special to have like the whole community. How old were you? I was in grade one, so I was about seven years old at the time. And it was just over the hill. It was a beautiful day. Sun was out, hot as anything. My mom looked amazing. My dad, he was sharper than anything. But the memory that stands out, usually for us, we always had shoes that were too big. Well, I was the last stop that day, and they only had a size too small. So I was wearing these little tiny shoes, and I was trying to keep my composure while this wedding was going on in the heat was crazy right and it, I, it just it was beautiful so like that's one memory that I'll never forget about here this was a large thriving community and now the small piece of undeveloped land is what remains the park is full of monuments to recognize and acknowledge the history of the community and that is the core issue. For decades, Africville has been treated like a relic of the past to be remembered in exhibitions and displays. Because if it's treated like something lost forever, then the wrongs never have to be addressed. Like a stolen artifact in a glass case from a forgotten civilization. But Africville is far from forgotten. The people still exist most of them in the surrounding areas of this park, people born in Africville and their children and their children and those after, this was their land. You probably have a lot of questions. How was Africville born? What did the community look like? How was this even allowed to happen? Well, along this journey of this podcast, you're definitely going to meet interesting people that have lived a life of despair in some cases, some of fruits of success. But what they all have done is endure a, a tragedy. We're going to find out how this community was originally formed. We're going to find out a lot of interesting facts about different people along the way, famous musicians, athletes, Africville's famous for George Dixon, the first black world boxing champion. Um, we're we're going to hear a lot of uh, stories of perseverance. Perseverance. We're going to hear stories of injustice. And we're also hopefully going to present the audience with creative solutions and a way that maybe they can help push this message forward. Ever since Eddie the Third and OG Eddie, ever since I was connected to the family, like, we have done things that have pushed the needle forward. Oh, for sure we have. The listeners need to know that we are fighting. We are pushing and moving the needle. And their support helps us move that needle even further. The only way to fix it and make it right is to put Africville back. We don't got to be living in shacks. We can have hotels, motels, high rises. There's enough property out there that can satisfy the need for Halifax in the housing crisis. It's up to us. In the next episode, we will explore the birth of Africville, the community that thrived on the shores of the Bedford Basin and was unified as a safe haven for people of African descent. If you want to learn more about how you can support the fight for Africville, visit africvilleforever.com. This podcast has featured the voices of the people of Africville past, present, and future. We encourage you to seek out more stories for yourself, as this show has barely scratched the surface of this incredible community. There are many more untold stories and those eager to share them. Africville Forever was hosted by Eddie Carvery III and Alfred Bergeson. It was edited by Reese Waters. The artwork was designed by Vanessa Thomas. Publicity and promotion by Nzinga Malar, Mary Gibran, and Alessia Staffieri. A special thank you to Jordan Heath Rawlings and Kyla Dudney. This has been a Podstarter production for the Frequency Podcast Network.